he's looking at whether or not the uh, time period that he, uh, or he's measuring whether or not the time period he's looking at is uh, post-2000, so that's after the, um, the cancer cluster appears. And then beta-1 is the coefficient uh, or the effect that he's interested in looking at, which is what happens in the post-cancer uh, cluster period in the uh, county that's actually going to get the cancer cluster. Uh, so that's basically the diffs and diffs estimate there. Um, and that's represented by beta-1. And the, the, the fact that he's setting this up as a regression now, instead of just doing the simple difference in the two uh, changes in the means, is uh, very useful because now we can add in additional control variables in this regression. So in particular, he's going to add in things like um, uh, housing, uh, like the lot size and the square footage of the house, the number of bedrooms, stuff like that. So the intuition here is that this uh, Churchill county uh, variable is going to control for any differences between the two counties that are constant over time, and the post 2000 variable controls for any differences between the two time periods that are constant across the county. So basically, factors that are changing over time but affect both of the, the counties uh, equally. And the uh, interaction is going to measure how much the cancer county, which is Churchill, changes after 2000 relative to uh, the control county, which is mine. So what he finds then is controlling for house size actually increases the uh, estimated magnitude of this leukemia cluster effect. And in some sense, that's not surprising because I already told you that the houses in the cancer county are actually getting larger after the, uh, the, the cluster is publicized relative to the houses in the other. Um, in the other county. So given that people are usually willing to pay more for a larger house, then you could think of like this 7.7% drop occurring, uh, occurring in spite of the fact that the houses are getting larger rather than because of it. Uh, so after we adjust for that fact, uh, the, the uh, price effect should be even larger. And indeed it is. So he finds that uh, the leukemia cluster now reduces housing values in the cancer county by 15.6%. The intuition here is that not only were prices in the cancer county falling, but the houses were also getting larger, and so you need to control for that. Um, so then the last thing that he does is basically use these numbers that he's calculated to uh, back out what the value of a statistical case of leukemia is. Uh, and the value he comes up with is basically $5.8 million, which is actually pretty close to the value of a statistical life uh, in lots of other contexts. So um, I, don't know, I mean, I guess at least consistent uh, in that sense. So in order to do that, remember that our, our like canonical formula here that we always go back to is the change in the willingness to pay or the willingness to accept divided by the associated change in risk. So he needs to, he basically has estimated the numerator now with all of his regressions where he found like the 15.6% change in housing prices. And he needs to now estimate the denominator, which is the associated change in risk uh, in, these, in this county. And so the lifetime odds uh, by his estimate rise from uh, basically 2.6 cases per 10,000 people, so 2.6 cases of leukemia per 10,000 people, to 14 and a half cases uh, of leukemia per 10,000 people. So the change in risk is then going to be 11.9 over 10,000, which is the difference between 14.5 and 2.6. And that works out to be 0 0.0012. Uh, now, that's not actually the exact number that he wants to use because um, uh, households don't just contain one person on average, they contain multiple people. Uh, so the average household size is 2.64. And remember, the thing that he's measuring here is a house price, so sort of the relevant number is how many people are living in the house rather than just a single person. Yeah, so you might be thinking, like, well, why then are we multiplying by the number of uh, adults who are in there as well? Uh, and I think, the, so I think the reason is because these lifetime odds are, um, you know, are measured over the entire person's lifespan rather than just whether or not they got it uh, as a child. But it's a good question. I have to go back and, and look exactly at, like, what numbers he's plugging in there to figure out whether you could have done it maybe differently by just looking at, like, the number of children in each household and the number of, um, of uh, or the odds of, like, a child getting leukemia. Um, the other thing, actually, so the other point that brings up, uh, which is a good point, which I actually sort of thought of in the slides, per se, is that, Presumably, I mean, if you see this cancer cluster and you believe that it's a real effect, you're not necessarily thinking that this is the only thing that could go wrong, right? Like, if you see all these kids getting leukemia and you think there's something bad in the water, then it's possible that the adults might also get some diseases that just haven't like, been noticed yet, right? Uh, and so in that sense, then, the change in risk in this denominator might be a little bit too small. Like, there might be sort of some other diseases that people in their minds, at least, are folding into the potential risk here. Uh, and if that's true, then this, BSL, this value of a statistical case of uh, leukemia is going to be sort of overstated because then this denominator should probably be even bigger than this because it's not just the change of risk for leukemia that should be in here, but also change of risk for like, maybe some other cancers or for like, birth defects or something like that. Um, but he does look, so he's just looking at leukemia, uh, and I think it is a sort of lifetime odds rather than just looking at the, the kids themselves. So his average household size is 2.64. You multiply that by 11.9, you come up with basically a 0.0031 change in uh, leukemia risk. The change in house prices we said was 15.6%. That number by itself isn't going to tell you anything because you need to know the dollar change, uh, but that's easy enough to, to get if you look at the average uh, housing prices. So it turns out to be about an $18,000 change. Um, and then this value of statistical case leukemia is just the change in uh, willingness to accept here uh, versus over the change in the uh, amount of risk, which is going to be 18,000 over 0031. So that works out to $5.8 million. Uh, so the conclusion is, maybe not surprisingly, uh, people are willing to pay a large amount to uh, avoid at least this perceived leukemia risk. Uh, now, I don't know what's happened since then, actually, because I mean, it's been almost 10 years now uh, since this thing was like, publicized and um, the study was done. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, the two things that I don't know are, A, has the background like leukemia uh, incidence rate gone back down to, to uh, normal levels? So if it has, then that indicates that maybe this was just a completely sort of random thing. There wasn't actually any increased risk. Uh, if it hasn't, then that's probably a pretty strong indication that there, in fact, is real risk here. And then the, the next question is, you know, if it has gone back down, then have the housing values recovered? Or is it just sort of like stigmatized for decades now as being this like, really dangerous county? The last thing that I'll just say um, here like, is that you know, this whole, the, the idea of like, a cancer cluster is, it's a very, statistically speaking, it's a very hard type of thing to measure whether or not there's actually a cluster. So, even if you believe there's a cluster, then there's an initial problem of figuring out like, what the cause of that cluster was, so that, and that's maybe even harder. But even just establishing that there is a cluster to begin with, ignoring like, whether or not you can figure out what the cause is, uh, is itself a pretty difficult problem. And the reason is that essentially, like, this, if you thought of this as sort of being like, um, I don't know, an experiment or a trial or something, this experiment or trial isn't being run once. It's basically being run like, hundreds of thousands of times all across the country. Right? So I told you at the beginning that the, uh, the rate was something like five or six or seven times the number of, of, uh, of uh, uh, leukemia cases that, that they observed was like five or six times the background rate or something, which would be a very unlikely event. Uh, and so, if your entire world just consisted of this one place that you observed once, then you'd probably say, oh, well, you know, this is like super unlikely. Uh, and so clearly there's something going on here, even if I don't know exactly what it is. The problem, though, is that essentially there's like, I don't know how many, you know, maybe like 100,000 different communities all around the country that are about the size of this community. And 
if one of those communities has a background rate that one year or you know, some five year, year period happens to be five times the average, then that community is going to think, oh, wow, we have a cancer cluster here, right? But what's happening is that you're basically looking at all of these different 100,000 communities and you're kind of running the same experiment in all communities, which is to like check out the statistics and see whether or not you have a cancer cluster. And so if you're doing it 100,000 times, then the probability of some very unlikely event happening once is actually pretty high, right? Because like, it's sort of like, you know, if I flip 10 heads in a row, you'd be like, whoa, that was really unlikely. But if I told you that we were going to sit here and I was going to like flip 10 coins 100,000 times, so basically it'd be 10 times or so we end with a million flips overall, but I was going to sort of segment them into like, you know, I'll flip 10 and record what happened that time and then do it again and again and again for like 100,000 times. Then you say, well, you know, give me you did that 100,000 times, like I'm perhaps not so surprised that you did find one time when you flipped all like 10 heads uh, in a row. And so that's kind of what's going on uh, when they're trying to figure out whether or not these cancer clusters are like actual events with some underlying cause or it's just that, like this one community out of all of the hundreds of thousands of communities in the United States happened to get unlucky that one year. Yeah, so I mean, I guess to the extent that it affects the estimates, the question would be, uh, what are people thinking the true change in risk is, right? So it's sort of like with the, the speed limits, as we talked about, like what we'd ideally like to measure is how lawmakers' perceptions have uh, changed or, or what, their, what their perceived uh, change in the risk from uh, increasing the speed limit was. And so likewise, likewise here, what we'd like to figure out is like, you know, in 1998, what were people in this county thinking the risk of leukemia was? And then in 2000, what were they thinking the risk of leukemia was? And since, we don't, since we're not doing a survey where you know, we're actually surveying 1,000 people or something about this, the best that, that they can do in the study is basically look at the, the actual observed change uh, and use that as sort of a proxy for what people are thinking. But if people were like pretty sophisticated and were like, oh, no, statistically, I know that even though this happened in this one county, like there's, you know, thousands of other counties it could have happened in, and so I don't think it's a real effect, then basically, what that would say is that their notion of like, what numbers in this denominator is probably smaller than, than what uh, Lucas is actually estimating there. Okay, so that's it for uh, talking about, first of all, what the VSLS actually is, and then uh, uh, showing a couple examples of how economists go about um, trying to estimate this value system. Um, and so that's well and good. Uh, the VSL is, is definitely a very important uh, quantity for policymakers. Uh, basically, it indicates how they're willing to, or how we think people are willing to trade off money and risk reductions, uh, but it doesn't really tell you anything about what the best way to achieve those risk reductions uh, is, right? So this is kind of similar to thinking about like, if you're just thinking about a normal good, like um, you know, a computer or like a banana or something like that, right? The VSL is the equivalent of saying, like, well, let me figure out how much consumers value this normal good. So like, how much are they willing to pay for a computer? How much are they willing to pay for a banana? Uh, but it doesn't tell you anything about what the cheapest or like most effective way to actually produce a computer or to produce a banana is. So the good that we're talking about here is basically like decreases in risk or increases in um, safety. And we measured or we tried to at least measure how much people are willing to pay for that. But that doesn't really tell us anything about like, well, what are the best ways for uh, society or for the economy to go about uh, trying to reduce risk or increase safety? So with the VSL, what you can conclude is that if something, uh, so say a particular technology or a program or whatever, uh, can save a life for less than the VSL, then the policymaker probably wants to invest in it. Because basically what that's saying is that the cost of that technology or the cost of implementing that program is less than the benefit uh, that would be gained from it as, as measured by the VSL. And so this thing that we'll call the health production function basically describes different ways in which society can potentially produce uh, better health, so like better safety, reduce risk. And it's sort of similar to a standard production function, uh, but it's just more complicated, so we won't actually write it down in general. Um, so like any production function, the health production function is going to map inputs to outputs. Uh, if you think back to like Econ 1, uh, just sort of a textbook uh, production function, so if you have some good that you're trying to produce, and usually we assume that it takes two inputs to produce that good. One input is capital, and the other is labor, and you can combine those two things together. And for a given level of capital input and labor input, you can produce like some level of output. Uh, now, in the real world, of course, things are more complicated than our very simplistic little model there. Uh, so in the real world, there are many different types of labor. We have different types of workers. We have different types of skills. And usually it's not just one skill that you need in one type of worker. They need to produce a good, but rather a whole bunch of different workers from managers to line people to people who will sell the good in the retail sector and so forth. Um, so there are a lot of different types of workers. And there's, of course, also many different types of capital from machines to uh, you know, computers to um, even uh, sort of uh, intellectual property types of capital and so forth. So real pr the real production function, in fact, has a multitude of inputs, even though we kind of simplify it when we're just doing like econ one stuff and talk about two inputs, which are generic labor and generic capital. And likewise, there are a lot of different inputs that uh, we could potentially use to produce better health and safety. So there are a lot of things you could invest in you would think would uh, improve people's health, and which inputs are more cost-effective, and which inputs are less cost-effective is going to be important in uh, determining how to, to sort of maximize the overall population's health. So the thing that I think is useful about talking about the health production function, well, I guess there are many things that are probably useful about it, but one thing that I think is particularly useful about it is that it should really be of interest to you even if you don't accept the, uh, the VSL literature. So, you know, like I started off saying that a lot of people are unwilling to put a specific number, like a price, on human life. Uh, and I said, well, the VSL isn't really doing that because what we're actually doing is basically measuring people's willingness to pay for small changes in risk and then just kind of rescaling that, that uh, that uh, number by the, the amount of the change in risk in the denominator here. So you shouldn't really think of it as being like the price for a, a specific life. Um, but in spite of that, I think people, a lot of people still are very uncomfortable about this sort of idea of like, well, you know, if there's an investment that we think is going to save somebody, then it's less than $6 million to make it. If it's more than $6 million, it's like their SOL. Well. Um, so I think that's pretty controversial. But even if you don't accept the VSL literature at all, like you just think that the entire concept is, is kind of meaningless, let alone the actual estimates that come out of the literature, um, even in those cases, you should still care about costs. So Society has finite resources, right? Like we don't have unlimited amounts of output here in terms of GDP to spend on everything under the sun. So there's, there's mathematically, there has to be an upper limit to the amount of health and safety you can actually purchase. Uh, you know, so the upper limit would be like, if we were just thinking about um, trying to increase uh, health through investing in healthcare, then you know, it's pretty clear that once we got to about 99% of the GDP going towards healthcare expenditures, which is what you'd eventually expect if you projected current healthcare cost uh, uh, increases uh, over a very long horizon, you know, at that point, you're almost at 100% and you can't really increase, uh, you can't really put any more resources into the healthcare sector at that point, unless you're a professional athlete, in which case you can always put in 110% of your available resources into the healthcare sector, uh, and maybe that would be a little bit more. But other than that, uh, you're pretty much stuck there. So given that resources are scarce, uh, we should deploy them so that we purchase the maximum amount of health and safety possible, presumably. So even if you're like, well, look, there's no specific number, which I'm going to say I don't want to pay uh, anymore to save that person's life, uh, you should still sort of be willing to think about, well, given that we can only spend X billion or X trillion dollars on this endeavor, uh, we would like to sort of maximize what we get for those X trillion dollars. Uh, and looking at the health production function, seeing basically which types of investments are cost effective and which
So analyzing which investments cost more for life saved and which cost less for life saved uh, is useful. And that's what this paper that's on the syllabus uh, basically does. So this is, this is essentially what we call a meta-analysis. They're not sort of getting their own data and doing their own study. Instead, they're just like going to the library, say just on the computer, and like looking up hundreds and hundreds of studies on this particular topic. And then from these studies, basically figuring out what's sort of the overall picture of what different types of interventions cost in terms of uh, dollars per life saved. Um, and so what the authors do here is they present numbers uh, in terms of uh, actually cost per life year saved rather than per life saved. So that's something that I don't, I guess I don't think we've talked that much about. Uh, certainly some of you have kind of asked questions or related to it both inside and outside of class. But um, when we talk about the value of social life, you could certainly think that uh, sort of not all lives are sort of uh, created equally. Well, they might be created equally, but at various points in the life uh, cycle, they might not be treated equally. So in particular, like you might think that society would be willing to pay more uh, to save a life of like, uh, you know, somebody who's say 20 years old, like yourselves, uh, than it would be to save the life of somebody who was like 89 years old with like heart disease and cancer and a bunch of other ailments that are almost certainly going to kill them within the next two years anyway, right? Um, and so the, the difference there, the reason that there's that, there's that kind of uh, uh, the heterogeneity, that difference there is not necessarily that like we're discriminating against old people per se, but that we're just looking at it in terms of uh, total life years remaining that we'd be saving here, right? And so it seems like sort of saving the life, uh, saving a life uh, in a way such that it's going to generate another sort of 60 life years. Uh, uh, that that person is going to experience is probably um, in some ways more valuable than saving uh, uh, the life of uh, somebody where they're only going to get another like one or two life years out of that. Um, and so de depending on the context, like you may be, like, you may be fine just sort of saying, well, I'm just going to look at sort of an average life saved, like in terms of um, the, the value of that. Uh, but in other cases, you might be more interested in sort of the actual number of life years that are being saved. Um, and so if an average person has about 40 life years remaining, then a VSL of say $5 million, which is kind of what I was saying is like a pretty standard number in the literature, uh, is going to translate into about a $125,000 per life year uh, number. Um, now, I mean, that, that calculation is going to be a little bit more complicated. So what I did is just divide 5 million by 40 there. In reality, you probably have to like incorporate a discount rate because you're looking over a four-year horizon. But then you also, at the same time, need to incorporate some sort of estimate of like how VSL will probably increase over time as society becomes richer. Uh, and so, I think on average, those two things might offset each other. And so, maybe this 125k figure isn't that far off. Um, but if you want to be like precise about it, you have to sort of think about those two issues. So, from a VSL perspective, uh, then if I'm saying that a five million VSL for an average person with 40 life years remaining uh, is going to travel is going to translate into 125,000 dollars per life year saved, then under that perspective, we'd say investments that cost about um, you know maybe 100,000 dollars per life year saved or less are probably worthwhile in the sense that the cost of those investments is less than the benefit uh, that we think we're getting from it as society. Uh, whereas investments that are over say 200,000 dollars are more questionable in the sense that the benefit now, which we're is maybe in the range of 125k is substantially less than the cost that's uh, being incurred there. So if you just look through the tables in that paper, uh, the thing that really stands out is that there's a uh, tremendous variation across all these different types of interventions uh, in terms of the cost of, of uh, saving a life year. So they basically list something like 500 life-saving interventions. They organize by category. Um, and all of these things are, are sort of, sort of uh, going across like, the entire spectrum of things you might think about for spending money on. So they have everything from like airplane safety to auto safety to fire safety to speed limits and uh, other traffic safety things, and then like reducing exposure to toxins and uh, medical uh, expenditures, like increasing screenings and, and having preventative care and so forth. Um, and I think one of the dominant sort of patterns or themes to messages to take away from from this paper is that the within category variation is often higher than uh, the between category variation. So what I mean there is basically that there's all these different categories and there's going to be variation both in terms of the average cost uh, for life saved across different categories and then also within each category there's different types of interventions you can do. There's going to be variation uh, in the cost within the category. And within each category, there's actually a very high variation uh, in cost, perhaps more so than the average variation between categories. So, for example, medical care is not uniformly better uh, or worse from an investment uh, perspective than, than traffic safety. Rather, it's the case that some medical interventions are better investments than others, uh, and some traffic safety interventions are better investments than others. And so there's going to be some medical interventions that are more cost effective than traffic safety interventions. There's also going to be some traffic safety interventions that are more cost effective than uh, some medical interventions. The second uh, sort of dominant theme here, I think, is that you can see evidence of uh, increasing marginal costs in basically all of the, the areas. So in some sense, as economists, we're not that surprised by that, right? Like we always think that marginal costs at some point are going to be increasing because there's sort of low-hanging fruit or cheap ways to do something at the beginning, and then you sort of start running out of cheap ways and you have to continue substituting for more expensive things. Um, so the, the general trend, I think, is that the, the first interventions are cheap per life save, regardless of which category you're looking at, um, and then the cost per life save increases as you exhaust those sort of low-hanging fruit and move on to the next one. So there's a couple um, instructive examples, I think. One involves cholesterol treatment, uh, and then the other one involves radon control. So the cholesterol treatment, basically the cost per life you're saved, uh, or if you want to look at it the other way, the sort of life you're saved per dollar. Um, but let's look at it from the cost perspective. So the cost per life you're saved uh, starts out to be very low, and then uh, rises uh, continuously until it, it gets to be absurdly high in some sense. Um, so it starts out at like twelve thousand dollars per life you're saved. It actually starts out at less than zero for one of the interventions, which I think is basically saying that like, so this is the. Um, so not to get too much, but this is the, the less than zero uh, number, which is the very first one there. I think is the. Uh, sort of like a, a case where this idea that preventative care can reduce overall expenditures uh, might actually be true. So one thing that you might hear when people are talking about, like, should we have, um, should we spend money on sort of like universal healthcare coverage and so forth? Uh, you know, one argument that people make in favor of, uh, of um, increasing overall coverage is that if people have health insurance, then they're willing to go into the doctor because it's cheaper. And so they might sort of get these like initial, um, uh, basically, either if they have an illness, might be treated sooner, or they might actually just get like preventive care that will, uh, that will prevent the illness from occurring to begin with. And so if you sort of make that early investment, then you can, uh, postpone or potentially totally eliminate uh, treating the actual illness at a later date. And so the overall, like, you might actually end up spending less overall money because you made that early investment uh, in preventive care rather than waiting until they got really sick and then putting them in the hospital, which is really expensive. So in some cases, that's probably true. And, you know, I think this less than zero dollars case is basically one of those cases they're saying, like, look, if we look at men who are middle-aged with heart disease and very high cholesterol, so cholesterol is over 250, uh, and we consider treating them with a statin to lower their cholesterol, uh, the cost of treating them, yes, it, you know, there's some positive cost of treating them, but uh, basically the avoided cost of not having to treat them for a heart attack later on is large enough that it more than offsets the cost of giving them the, the medicine. Uh, so that would be a case where preventive care actually does result in